Well, welcome. It's with enormous enthusiasm and honor that I welcome you to this uh, esteemed panel. I want to make sure the cart's on before we continue. All right, I want to thank Doreen Radin from Caption Advantage. I want to thank Empire Interpreting Service and our, uh, what happened? We'll just make the captions just a little bit smaller, it would be good. Is that resolved now, Drew? Okay, good. All right, thank you. We want everything to be as it should be, so I'm appreciative of people's feedback and, and comments. So I want to thank, uh, as I was saying, Dory Maiden from Caption Advantage and also Terry Slater and the team from Empire Interpreting Service, specifically Marika Larson, which is incidentally spelled with an E, not an O, and my name is spelled I-E, but we're not talking about me right now. <laughs> so Marika has been an exceptional uh, presence in coordinating all of the layers of this conference, which as I'm sure you've all perceived, has been um, enormously uh, nuanced in its attention to multiple communication approaches including people who type to communicate, people who are using sign as a primary mode of communication, people who have different affective components to their communication, people who gesture wildly because they grew up in Brooklyn and they're Jewish, you know, <laughs> things like that. So, yeah, woo. So I want to introduce the panel and I'm going to tell you how this is going to work. And I want to thank everyone for their patience with some of the technological adventures we've had today. And I want to say without defensiveness that one of the reasons I'm cool with this some of it went down and we resolved it each time is because in order to make a conference like this as inclusive as possible, you have to take certain kind of risks with technology and that's because if you want people to be able to participate fully who can't be present, which addresses all kinds of issues of access, including socioeconomic, then you have to make it possible for people to Skype in and then use different kinds of things like Adobe Connect and if those things don't work, then you have to manage to figure out a way to resolve that. So everyone was very kind and flexible today and I want to thank you for that. So this uh, is Notes from the Field and I called it that in an ironic way in a sense. Um, you know, being out in the field of daisies is not what we mean, but we are thinking artfully of what being in the field means broadly. So I'm going to say that we have three questions we're going to be addressing and each um, panelist is going to comment for a few minutes in response to those questions. And I'm going to moderate that um, by, by maybe making some summative comments. But the most important thing about this is we want the audience to participate in the conversation. I think this is one of the first times at a Comic-Con and possibly at any symposium that we've had this array of people with these different beautiful backgrounds speaking together in, in multiple ways. So the first question I'm going to ask just so you have it in mind and the panelists have in mind, uh, is the following, and right after that I'll explain the second question, and then the third, but then I'm gonna give people a minute to kind of contemplate, um, and some people have notes and some people don't, but then I'm gonna give bios for all the panelists. But first I wanna start with the questions, because after all we're at a university, so questions are important. So the first question is, why is cripping the con the con important? But the second question is, what does it mean to you to identify as an artist who is part of the deaf cultural world and or the disability rights world? And the third question, I'll repeat these, but I just want everyone to kind of process them a little bit. The third one is, in what ways would you describe your roles in life as an artist? So I'm gonna start by reintroducing Matt and Kay Daigle. And I've been given permission to shorten their bio a little bit. It is in the program and it's worth reading because it's an amazing thing. And I really want to thank Matt and Kay for coming here from Burbank, which is not Berkeley, but no less important as the other big B in California, as I heard them joke earlier. So Matt and Kay have been comedy partners since 1993 when they met and were cast together in a deaf hearing, deaf slash hearing touring theater company 
After touring a year with the company, Matt attended Northern State University in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and received a degree in advertising design. Kay went on to get her master's degree at Gallaudet University in interpreting while Matt toured with the Tony Award-winning National Theater of the Deaf. Over the years, Kay and Matt have collaborated on several projects together, performing in variety shows and community theater. And there's an elaborate, beautiful narrative, which is really a love story, I would say, about how they came to know each other as advocates and as cultural leaders and as artists. And as a result of various conversations, they decided it would be important to collaborate, one of them having a very long background in the arts and one having a long background in the written form, which of course arguably is certainly an art. And so they got together and created that deaf guy, which is certainly featuring the deaf guy, it's Matt, and the hearing wife, rumor has it, it's gay, and a coda son, a child of deaf adults, for those of you who don't know that acronym, and how life can be really funny when you throw them all together at home and in the world. So in real life, uh, Kay and Matt have been married for 20 years and live in Burbank, California with their son, Hayden. Um, so now, I'll do this alphabetically. Kanisha Friend, who's also a panelist here with us. I'm introducing people alphabetically by last name. Kanisha is a Syracuse University senior in the School of Education, majoring in Selected Studies in Education with a focus in Disability Studies. Kanisha published an illustrated children's book, I Too Am a Dancer, the story of a black, hard of hearing girl who challenges ideas of disability, disabilities in parentheses there. Uh, Kanisha has maintained leadership roles in numerous spaces on campus, including in the Disability Cultural Center. And she also does things, uh, varied things, and many, myriad, to empower people of all backgrounds. She's involved with the Prison Outreach Project, uh, program, excuse me, Grace Episcopal Church, and is working on a second children's book about which she spoke at one of the breakout sessions today. Kate Pollack is also here on the panel. Uh, Kate has been a cartoonist for a very, very long time as well. And she's a second year master's student in the Syracuse University School of Education, pursuing a master's in cultural foundations of education and a certificate of advanced study in disability studies. Kate identifies as deaf and is the co-activities chair of the Disability Student Union. Her academic work is directed toward advancing human rights and disability rights internationally and in the United States with a focus on deaf issues. She's also one of the two graduate assistants who work with me in the Disability Cultural Center. Uh, Kate received an undergraduate degree from Hunter, and she majored in history, and she's quite the historian. If you ever want to talk about history nerd um, in a deep way, that's a good person with whom you might chat. And she has a degree as well in the fine arts from Munson Williams Proctor Institute in Utica, which is now part of the Pratt Institute. So there are lots of different layers of her bio that involve her work as a cartoonist and illustrator, and her work has been on display all day in our art exhibit area. Um, and I want to give a shout out to her mom who's in the audience tonight. Also, uh, Carlisle Robinson is here, and we're delighted that Carlisle was able to join us from not far from Boston. Carlisle is one of the celebrities of the deaf comic world and is identified as a deaf genderqueer comic creator and illustrator. Carlisle is passionate about educating the public with rarely told stories by minority groups, especially deaf people. They went to Gallaudet University as an undergraduate and received a Master's in Fine Arts in the spring of 2015 from the Center for Cartoon Studies. All of the websites for folks I'm mentioning, uh, if they do have a website, they're all mentioned in our program. And last but certainly not least is my friend Gilles Stromberg, who attended Syracuse University. <laughs> Oh, that was loud, sorry. Between 2008 and 2012, where they received a bachelor's in fine arts and illustration and minored in lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender studies. Gilles was an engaged student at Syracuse, being part of OutCrowd Magazine, the LGBT Resource Center, the SUM, SUMB, and Chime Masters. Since 2011, they've worked in creative, executive, and advancement roles for both national and local LGBT-based nonprofit organizations in Washington, D.C., Baltimore area, uh, in the metropolitan parts of town. So Gilles currently mentors and supervises students at the MICA program, which is the Maryland Institute of College of Art, Maryland Institute College of Art, I think I got it, sorry, um, Student Activities Office, and recently was accepted to a master's program in San Francisco. Which program is it? 
the University of San Francisco Higher Education Administration. So I want to give a round of applause to Jill, please. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on. Come on, let's go. Come on. Uh, while their main job consists of supporting student organizations and major campus events, they provide a lot of critical input in the creation of resource guides to support students who identify as trans and faculty who work with trans students. So again, there's a very elaborate and beautiful bio uh, that you can read about uh, Gilles. One of the reasons Gilles is with us, of course, today, among many others, is that uh, since the Comic-Con began in 2013, Gilles has been a foundational energetic presence in helping us because we wouldn't have had the Axis Avengers without Gilles' artfulness and mindfulness. So now what I'd like to do is repeat the first question, and I'm going to ask each panelist to take about three to four minutes to answer, uh, and I think we'll do that. Just why don't we go from <coughs> K toward G? Why don't we do it that way? Does that work for everybody? So first question. This is like Jeopardy. <laughs> this is like Crip Jeopardy. Okay. Why is cripping the Comic-Con important? So we'll start with Kay. Okay. I'm going to use my voice. Uh, you, so there's a microphone on the table. Okay. We can pass it down. That'd be great. And then we'll be sure the card provider is accessing it. By the way, all of this is being transcribed, obviously. And then we're going to have this captioned uh, and put on YouTube. So it'll be available to the general public with everyone's permission, of course. So, so don't break out in song, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Why is cripping the Comic-Con important? Okay, for me, what I've noticed today is how much there's dialogue that's going on. Um, new ideas, maybe old ideas that are being revisited. But what I really love to see is these wonderful presenters getting up and talking about their experiences, experiences that I don't have at all, but that I want to know more about. And I want to be able to have an environment such as this to be able to sit around and talk about or ask questions and feel that it is a safe place. About 15 years ago, I was the director of disability services for a university in South Dakota. And I have seen over the years how access and ideas and research just keeps changing and changing and since I've left that field so much is different now and I love that and I think that's because people are getting together and talking talking about their experiences and coming up with better ways that we can do things make things more ac accessible to people with disabilities or differently abled people. Mm -hmm. However, we're gonna talk about that. These, these are the places that we do that. That's why I think it's important. Okay, so what we'll do is each person will comment and we're ma making room for all of you. So if you have any questions, feel free to jot them down or use a mobile device or any other way you might communicate with yourself in preparation for the asking questions of the panel. Thank you, Kay. Matt, what do you think? Why is gripping the Comic Con important? I think maybe what I'll do is stand up, make sure everyone can see me okay. Okay? Every, uh, you're, okay, your voice is me. okay, good. I, um, as a deaf person, I think this conference is really important to honor the people that attend. I mean, sure, we present our work and also, you know, have an exhibit booth and, and a table, I should say. And, you know, all those things are, are really great to see all that's happening. But also to see, you know, this type of thing go on in the future, to continue. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm learning new things. As, as Just like as Kay said, the, the variety of, of differently able people here. I mean, I think that it's, it's so exciting because we all have such similar goals in mind through comics, through artwork, through the different talents that we have. And together, what we share and how we, you know, as disabled or deaf or, or however it is that we're doing things, I just, I, I just can't express how thrilled I am to be here. Thank you. What do you think, Kate? Why is gripping the Comic-Con important? I think that, uh, oh, thank you. I'm going to voice as well because I don't sign well um, and speak well at the, at the same time. So, Cripcon or Cripping the Con 
is extremely important, I think, for a variety of reasons, um, especially for deaf people. Because, just speaking from my own personal experience, um, comic books and cartoons um, are a great tool for deaf people to learn about communication. And it's something that I've discovered um, in the deaf community is that often deaf children, when they're growing up, turn to comic books because you don't have to hear to understand all of these range of motion and there's so much going on, but it's all illustrated with words. So if a sound happens, <laughs> it's illustrated in the comic book, like boom or pow or whatever it is, you know, um, and the facial expressions of the character um, goes along with the writing coming out of the word balloon. And I didn't really think about it until recently, but I began to talk to other deaf people about comic art, um, which unfortunately can be looked down on somewhat as not high art. You know, when I was in art school, um, it was kind of disparaged a little bit, you know, and um, I always held my ground with it. I said, this is what I love, you know, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna pretend I don't love it, it's important. But it was a little disheartening to have that experience to go to art school when I was 18 with my comic book collection and my, <laughs> you know, drawing cartoons and wanting to incorporate that into my art and being told, well, this isn't really high art. This is not what you're at school for. Um, but you sort of come out of that and realize this is actually really important art uh, for a lot of reasons, and we can all come together here. Um, in a variety of different disability identities and allies are represented. Um, it is a great feeling of inclusion, and I hope to um, see this continue, um, like our other panelists have indicated, because I think that um, in popular culture, more and more, we're seeing disabled comic book characters. And comic book characters in mainstream books, um, graphic novels, and movies that have marginalized identities. And I think that really resonates with a lot of people. And it's good for marginalized identities, whatever they are, to be represented in every area of life. And comics are no exception. Um, some people might say, well, this is silly, we don't, this isn't, you know, but it's important for people with disabilities to participate fully in their community, whatever, whatever that may be. Even if reading comic books, going to the movies, or if it's something more important, uh, like uh, college education. It's, it's all about inclusion. So that's why I think that the CRIPCON is an important, very important event. Thank you. Kanisha, why is gripping the Comic Con important? Um, okay, can everyone hear me? This is fine? Okay. So, I would say gripping the con is extremely important. Put Simply the mic a little bit closer, so sorry. Better? Yes. Okay, okay so Kanisha. I would say that gripping the con is extremely important for the simple fact that it builds more bridges than it presents more gaps. I think, plainly put, it presents community and it welcomes and it fosters that community um, so that it's sustainable. Um, I, as I was said before, I'm a disability studies um, minor. And so in one of my classes, it was a disability studies class, which is open to any major, any minor, any student can take it. However, mostly students that are interested in disability studies or minor, they would take to certain classes. But um, this class that I took, it was my sophomore year, and Rachel and Diane had actually presented in that class and it was along the lines of um, Marvel characters and how they relate to disability. And so I really loved that class because I noticed that that was the first time where a lot of the students who weren't previously interested in disability studies, they, they were just taking it to fill a requirement or they were just taking it just because like, as a filler. This was the first time where I really felt like more students who were in the back of the classroom were raising their hand and really wanted to, they were invested in the material, in, into the curriculum because for the first time, disability wasn't presented along the lines of medical or, or as a cure. It was um, represented in a creative outlet, as a creative space, and um, things that people can actually relate to. And for you to understand that disability is diversity. And so I think that class was extremely important. And Cripping the Con is basically that class extended. Um, we have it as, we have it here 
as a conference, an all-day conference where people from around the nation come and they present their, materi their material and present their, um, their art. And whatever is going on in their life within that state, they bring it here to Syracuse where we all can have conversations about it. You know, we can dissect it, we can complicate the conversation. And I think that is absolutely beautiful. When you sit down at the end of the day and you think about that, the fact that so many people came here to fellowship and to just talk about the stuff that has been pissing them off their entire time, you know, all this ableism and everything like that. And so that people like me who are able-bodied can understand what I need to work on, what we need to fix, and how we can really foster this community. So that's first and foremost. Um, from a personal standpoint, along those lines, um, Crippin' the Kind is extremely important to me because it was the first place that I came to where I presented on my, on my children's book when it was just an idea. And so I got a lot of input from everyone who were just willing to help and willing to just lend resources and help me with my market research. And a lot of students come here not knowing exactly what they want to do, but after attending this conference, they realize the things that they can do and how much they can really build on their idea and expand it a lot more so that it's diverse, it's inclusive, and it's extremely helpful, I think, for your artistic um, endeavors, on your personal endeavors, and then, of course, also with friendships, which is like awesome as well. Thanks, Kanisha. Carlisle, why is Crippin' the Comic Con important? Uh, you know, what I've learned from the, this conference, Cripping the Con, is, you know, it's been so eye-opening, the amazing accomplishments, the, the people getting together, the kits that people share of themselves, the, you know, the things that they've gone through, their struggles, the things that they share. I mean, I really want to thank you for all the, the hard work that you've done. This is a complete honor for me to be here. I think it's important, you know, to show you know, what we do. I mean, I, I've loved comics ever since I was a child. And to be able to show uh, that work, to be able to share it with others, to be able to, you know, uh, provide information about misconceptions, to be able to, you know, learn more about the actual research that's being done. You know, I mean, <laughs> what it's like to, to be deaf, to share those types of, of uh, issues. and. and I don't know, it's just, it's such a great thing to be able to be in a safe place and to have full access and, you know, to know that everybody, you just can do it. I mean, to have the inclusion with the interpreters, the access in so many different ways, to be able to make it barrier free. And, you know, it reminds me of just a really safe place where I can meet people. And uh, I hope that it, it, it spreads, you know, not just from here to continue, but something that could happen throughout the U.S. and to, you know, a, a way to encourage disabled artists and, you know, like uh, they had mentioned, the way that comics had been, you know, sort of looked down upon in the past and, you know, said that, you know, it's not really an important form or something like that. And, uh, you know, our own government to be able You know, as an undergraduate in government, to be able to to go on to uh, you know into the comics and and follow the passion of that work, you know, I mean, to be able to um, not just say that comics aren't in, aren't important, but to be able to look at the word, the picture, and the marriage of those two things to help people understand better what it's like for someone like me, and. And it's so great to see people here, to see people so motivated, to see the, the creative work that they're doing, whether it's writing or drawing. It's just, it's awesome. Jim. Um, I want to make sure I provide equity with the time that I take, so I have three bullet points. Um, so why is Kipcon important? Um, I think the first thing is um, power and autonomy in spaces. Um, and having that capacity to do that at Cripping the Comic Con. Um, there's something that comes with having a space of equity. Um, when I say equity, I mean like elevating a community that has been marginalized in order to provide 
equal access moving forward. So that may mean someone else in that space isn't receiving as much, but it is equalizing marginalization. Um, but I think there's a, a lot of emotional health and revitalization that comes from spaces that provide power to those who are marginalized. Um, and I think Cripping the Comic Con is doing that fantastically uh, and, and excelling in that. And I think I would echo the statement of definitely it builds more bridges uh, than gaps. I think that's a definitely a great way to put it. Is it the best thing ever in the world? And that's not possible, right? Mm -hmm. So knowing that there's a consistent dialogue of how we can continue to elevate the marginalized and provide power. Um, the second one is having the space to have in community spaces. Yes, um, Cripping the Comic Con is a space where we do have allies as well as folks who do have a, a range of abilities that are here. But that means but with a power dynamic, there's a capacity to be like, hey, just, you know, this is an in-community space and we're having a conversation and this is a space where I can say, I see you and then I see us here, right? And I think, you know, having the, the weight of saying, I see you and I see us here is something that I think is very fulfilling. Um, and I think the third thing is that um, as someone who has narrative experience at comic book conventions and anime conventions, that for a lot of people is their first exposure to someone who is like them, right? And not just one identity, but so many other identities. Um, I know in my narrative experience, um, Otakon, which is an anime convention, was the first place where I met someone else who was transgender. Um, it was also somewhere else where I've met someone who navigated anxiety and depression the same way that I do. Um, and we expressed it through cosplay. We expressed it through our love of comic books and sh shared narratives of finding things in comic books that were like, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> um, excuse me. Um, but I'm sure you able to find those folks there. I'm sorry, we were just sharing a sign the, for the sign for cosplay. Oh. I, was just, I was just sharing that sign. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Not so good. <laughs> um, so being able to kind of switch the dynamic, I think at general comic book conventions and anime conventions, it's like you may have a panel about disabilities and, and intersections, or you may be at like a photo shoot and like, oh my God, that one person's like me, but you don't get to have that sit down conversation and be like, let's have a deeper discussion about this. And Cripping the Comic Con is the place for that. I'm so glad this is being recorded. Uh, I think we should go for a grant. That's what I'm thinking here and try to broaden this even more and uh, so thank you all for those beautiful comments and I'm gonna try to type up some of these notes and share them with everyone. Uh, but I have some thoughts, but I'll hold them back. So the second question from Kay Dejean, which is my new favorite phrase. Uh, what does it mean to you to identify as an artist who is part of the deaf culture world and or the disability rights world? Well, for those people that know me, know that I'm a very eh, emotional person. I have a lot of emotions always raging through me. And there is, there is absolutely no words that can express the absolute privilege that I have to be in the deaf community every day. I can only sign it. No English words for that. And that has been 22 years when I was cast in a deaf theater company at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf in Rochester, New York. And I have forever been changed. And since that day that I began my journey into the deaf world, I have always tried to maintain a absolute and utter respect for the culture and for the language and I am always learning. I've got my master's degree from Gallaudet University. I've been an interpreter, a certified interpreter for 20 years, and I still feel like I know nothing because I am always learning. And deaf, the deaf culture, deaf people, the language, the linguistic aspects of the language are constantly inspiring me and constantly teaching me. And as a co-creator of that deaf guy, I absolutely must get the thumbs up for my husband every time I write one of the comic strips. It is such a collaborative effort that it's hard to pull us apart to say which is what, of course, I don't draw, but it is out of our discussions about deaf culture and language 
that give birth to our humor. And it is definitely our personal experience, and we are so grateful for the numerous emails and comments that we get from hearing and deaf alike who talk about how our comic strip has helped them feel a part of a larger whole, how they feel more accepted. We have gotten emails from people who have just become deaf or losing their hearing where they said, I was in such a state of depression, I didn't know what to do and I didn't even know there was a community out there and I found your comic strip. So it's those kinds of comments and when I just see people come to our booth and are laughing and they look at our cartoons and they're smiling, that's all I need. I'm good. I'm good to go. Wow, that was good. <laughs> okay. Um, I've, I think that most of the artists here are experienced by, are, are influenced by their nature. I mean, their passion. They have a passion for something. So for me, I just happened to get into comics and to draw, and I just happened to be deaf. That didn't change. But as she said, having the two of us being able to work together on that deaf guy, you know, is, you know, we want to be able to share our passion and our goals for the deaf and hearing communities to come together. I, I, I think that's absolutely what our passion is. I, we've been involved in theater, we've been involved in the community, we've been involved in ASL as a language and exposing people. We're trying to, to show something from our, from our art that hopefully when people see it, they'll be able to understand something in a palatable way, you know, so that people see something new and are exposed to a culture and don't have to feel awkward about it. You know, that's, that's our work. We want to make people laugh and make sure that they understand that that's who we are. And, you know, like you say, as artists, everyone has their own talents. It's something that becomes automatic. It's, it's, it's not like it's a, a chore. It's not like it's, oh, I have something that I have to do. It's from our hearts. And this, this passion for the work, the commitment, and the enjoyment, you know? We enjoy the whole process, so I think that's what it is. That's what we do, that's our art. So like Matt, um, I just, always had a passion for cartoons and I began to draw, I think as my mother who's sitting in the audience today can contest to, before I could even write, um, I began to draw cartoons. It just appealed to me. And I, I happen to be a deaf person. Um, and for me, it's, I, I draw a cartoon character who is autobiographical. Um, she is based on me and her name is Kately. Um, some of my cartoons are out on the table outside. We can read about her. And sometimes I mention that she's hard of hearing or deaf or she wears hearing aids, but often I don't because that's not really the uh, central focus of the cartoon. The cartoon is more about her adventures and uh, the trouble that she gets in and her personality. Um, it's not, there's so much more to having a disability and than just the devices that you wear or in your ears or, um, you know, uh, the fact that sometimes I, I strain to hear, I don't know what's going on, or I use sign language, so that I, I never really thought about incorporating that too much. I just had other ideas. Um, but now I'm starting to realize that your comics is a great platform. Um, there's a lot of freedom in comic art. Um, there's a lot of liberation in it. And as I embrace my deaf <coughs> identity more, um, I realize that this is a great way to impart information in maybe a humorous way um, to people out there who are interested um, in, the, in the topic and might not feel comfortable 
asking or not really have a way to know, especially children. Um, I think when I was when I was little, like I was saying earlier, comic art really spoke to me. So if there's more representations of deaf, hard of hearing children or characters, for example, in comic art, um, and I can make it known that my character is a deaf or a hard of hearing character, then that, that would be great, I think, to sort of get that out there and um, so that readers can have something to identify with, but also realize that this is not my sole identity, this is not everything about me, it's just one aspect of me, and I experience life in the same way uh, pretty much as other people, so it doesn't have to be a central focus of it. Because when you are a disabled person, often the way that you are moving through the world, however that may be, um, the perceptions that able-bodied people have is that this is your full identity. This is just your disability is who you who you are, and that's what they see or they notice or they, right away. Um, but that's not my experience. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think about it all the time, <laughs> and that's kind of represented in my cartoons. So I would say I'm much like Kay, where I take a lot of pride in still um, being a student and just continue learning. I had a lot of trouble that I touched upon um, in the breakaway session about me even writing and being an artist um, that's centered around deaf culture, um, centered around disability rights, because I don't, I don't identify someone with a disability. So I had to... The first step was coming to terms with who I am as a person. How do I identify? Um, what work have I done? And continue pushing through that. And so I thought about that for a while. And the word that really stuck with me and how I view myself was being a witness. And so understanding and being up to date with what is going on in the disability community, what is going on with deaf culture, what are, um, what, what is going on? And just making sure that I am active in researching that, active in having those conversations, knowing what I need to do on my part, um, how I can educate myself, how can I educate my peers, what can be done. And so that's something that is, that I take a lot of pride in. Um, while, I'm a, while I am a student, I make sure that I am a witness as well. And so with all of the products that I create, it's not to intrude, it's not to create a platform for myself, but to just know that the platform is there and then have that conversation for people who have been working for that platform, who deserve that platform, have that platform as well. Um, and I take a lot of pride in that, in making sure that I step back. And so none of my products are me, you know, centerfold and me in the front pages, none of that. You know, it's about um, characters who um, would have disabilities but also represent a large part of who I am as a person. And so as an artist, one thing that I really love to do is connecting um, different cultures, connecting different identities. Because for me, um, being a black woman and being a black woman on this campus, diversity literally was reduced to racial and gender binaries. And so when I would talk to a lot of my friends within the black community, um, and I mentioned, you know, being a disability studies minor or my work that I'm really interested in um, deaf culture and this and that, I'm taking these classes, I'm part of these programs and, th and things like that of that nature. They just looked at me like, you know, okay, that's that's great. And so I took those comments and I took those little little you know, little nudges of, and I took it as me saying, you know, I need to start working. There's something that must be done. And so my products are a uh, large influence of who I am, my experiences, but also the experience that I have been so privileged to hear about from people within the deaf community and people within um, that in the disability community as well. And so I don't take this role lightly. I don't think it's easy at all, and I do know that constant work must be done on my end for me to be sure that I am always self-checking myself, that I'm always conscious, that I'm all, always self-conscious of what's going on in the world, what's going on within myself, and so that I'm aware of when I may be overstepping my boundaries, um, that my ears are open and I am listening to comments. And so me being here at CRIPCON, which I touched on in the first question, I, I'm here because I want to have that conversation. I want to hear what is um, needed in these children's books. I want you guys to critique my work. I love it, you know? I, as an, as an artist, while I'm so sensitive about my stuff because I, you know, I'm so closed off when I'm creating it, 
I really do look forward to hearing those comments and how people feel um, about the work that's being done. Do all this representation work that I'm um, focusing on, is it really making a difference? Am I doing my part? And so me being an artist is, is largely being a witness and being a student. For me, being an artist means, you know, in the deaf community, I have these things. You know, I'm labeled a deaf person. I'm from a deaf family. I have deaf parents. I have deaf grandparents. I have deaf great grandparents. You know, generations of deaf people. So that's an identity cultural thing. But for me, I'm also a third generation artist. My mom was a terrific artist. My grandmother was a terrific artist. So third generation. As an artist, I think about, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I don't, I'm old enough to hold my hand, OK? And I can create art. I started creating art when I was just <coughs> little tiny child who was just able to have the fine motor skills to draw. And that's when I began drawing. My mom has pictures of, oh my gosh, I was drawing on my leg with a marker. I was an extremely creative child. But, I mean, obviously art means many things to many people, but comics stole my heart. It was my true it just was this melding of everything that meant something to me. So I just, I had so many, um, so many panels of my artwork, plus pictures underneath them. So there's panels of words. And then, so there's panels of words on top, and then there's the visual representation of the meaning of the words underneath them. <laughs> so when I do a visual representation of meaning in my artwork, the English isn't a direct translation of what that is. So it's sort of different information. So there's two different impacts going on. There's the visual impact, and then there's also the English words. A recent example of that is um, I have an English sentence um, for um, building. So I have the English sentence building. And then I have the noun, and then I have the adjective, and then I have the verb. So a boy, a boy, sorry, my mic, my mic is not Sorry, my mic is, something's wrong with me. OK, so OK, there's a, the English sentence is, so a tall building, there's a tall building, and there's the adverb, the adjective, the verb, the noun. And um, so there is a car that is making its way very, very trepidatiously up a hill. See how there's um, this sign and then the, the English translation is taking quite a while. So that's part of what this is. <laughs> and that actually applies to comic strips because so much can be conveyed in each panel. And I just love that art form because so much information is conveyed in such a short and concise way. And I mean, there's so many ways that you can play with that. Comics, th com comics are often misconstrued as being just this very simplistic or very basic message. But what I like is to really, really send a message home of complexity. So yeah, and when I was mainstreamed, uh, in other words, I went to school with hearing uh, students, not deaf students, 
And I took on the responsibility of educating about what it is like to be a deaf person in a hearing world, because a lot of people didn't know. You know, I don't want to use the word burden because I really wanted to take on that role. I felt that it was important to educate people. The world is going to be a better place if people are more open-minded and more educated. So, and that's what being a deaf <laughs> artist means to me. Uh, so for a nerd reference, um, it's about Legend of Zelda. I feel like I'm talking a lot about power up here, so I feel a little bit like Ganondorf, so apologies in advance for that. Um, so I have three bullet points and a quick statement. Um, when I read this question when it was provided um, by Diane, I thought, I looked at the word identify as, and I had an existential crisis. Um, because knowing about, like, I know, as, as Audre Lorde had said, there's no hierarchy of oppression, but knowing in social environments and social communities, there is an understanding of, I know um, that I'm able-bodied, um, and then I, I, I can identify as able-bodied, um, but also when it comes to my mental illness, uh, I am very stealth. Um, and also with the complicated relationship of trans identities is with, with a mental illness, knowing that I recently went through a procedure which has provided me more stealth, um, knowing that there's a major privilege um, that comes with a part of that is something that I consistently think about in saying, how much power do I have in this hierarchy to have power to identify myself? Um, if you had listened to my keynote last year, um, it was called Don't Call Me an Ally. You can call me whatever you want. You can call me a snickerdoodle if you want to. You have the power to do that. Um, but I think one thing is that, um, oh, where was I going with that? God bless. It's that um, ally, I think allyship for me is a complicated word and a complicated concept, and I don't like the word ally. But if we need to use it, it's a verb and not a noun. Um, that's something that's very important. It's not something where you like have a milestone, well, well, I'm an ally now. That one guy at that one table said I'm an ally, so check that box off the list. That's really great. Um, so I also last year had put a picture of a sugar cookie that has writing on it with icing that says, meets standard requirements of being a decent human, meets standard requirements of being a decent human being. Um, so I think a lot of times we're in, where we're in mixed community spaces, we find folks who are able-bodied or who don't navigate disabilities as much being like, well, I do A, B, and C and want validation um, for what they've done. Um, and I think that is something that can be very harmful and very damaging where we're elevating voices of those who want validation as opposed to getting equity. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. And then when I'm talking about my role as an artist, because I have the privilege of, you know, the third question we have is your role in life as an artist. I have a privilege of something, somebody who is stealth, that my mental illness goes immediately into my practice of art and isn't questioned in a way that maybe a physical ability or other very visible mental illnesses would be. Um, so let's say we talk about depression. Uh, that's something narratively in art history that is very common. Um, and we talk about anxiety, that's something that's very common in your standard normative art history. So that's something where I think I had a lot of privilege in having those be the items that I'm talking about in my art. Um, so what I'm saying with that is when I'm working with the Axis Avengers, as I've heard other folks say as well, um, there's three dynamics of when we work with a community. Um, I do a lot of community art and service in Baltimore, and we have this philosophy that we teach to our students there. Um, so the three ways are working to the community, working for a community, and working with a community. Um, the most damaging is working to a community where you're saying things like, oh, I think you need this, so here. And then everyone's like, what the heck? I don't need this. Like, why'd you give me a rubber duck? I did not ask for this. Um, working for a community is asking someone like, hey, what do you want? They're like, well, I'm taking a bath right now. I'd like a rubber duck. Then like, oh, here's a rubber duck, right? Um, working with someone is being like, hey, Let's work together. I can't make a rubber duck analogy for this. <laughs> um, taking a bath together is a little awkward. <laughs> but working with someone in the same boat. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, that's true. But also being like, hey, what would make you really happy right now? They'd be like, you know, I think making some homemade ice cream. So working together in like the big picture, being like, I want to be happy right now. Maybe that's a bath and a rubber duck, and maybe that's just making some ice cream. So working with that person and getting the you know ice cream, salt, and all that, and making the ice cream together. 
right? So my philosophy with the Axis Avengers is working together, right? So there's some identities in the Axis Avengers that you know I share some intersectionalities, but I don't hold those identities. And why it would be so ridiculous and ludicrous of me to be like, well, this character is mine, or I made this character. No, this character, I'm holding the megaphone, for lack of a better analogy, to elevate the voices of others through my work with the Axis, uh, Axis Avengers. I'm really just blown away, which I mean in a pacifist sense. So the, the last question, and then we'll open it up for discussion, and I may not even make a few remarks, I'll see. I really want the audience to have a chance, because it's not really an audience, we're all together in collaboration, speaking of working with, and when we introduced Al earlier, that was very much the point and the spirit of Al's creation, uh, the newest Actress Avengers, created in partnership with a number of people whose contributions created the character that was then illustrated by Gilles. So the third and last question from K to Gilles, which sounds much better than A to Z, don't you think? <laughs> so in what ways would you describe your roles and life as an artist? to think about this for just a minute. That's a big question for me because I, it's so much a part of who I am, being an artist, that I don't know if I can separate myself from it. It's who I am 100%. And I know that it, it carries with it so much responsibility and I take it very seriously. But at the same time, I know that it really affords me the opportunity to experience the world in such a way that creates a constant flow of love through me and to other people. And that flow of love, if you'll just afford me this, is the way that I live every day. Um, I love people. I love human nature. I love humanity. I love diversity and cultures and language, and I love everything about it. And when I'm in a space where I can create that through my comic strips, through our comic strips, sorry, sweetie, <laughs> through our comic strip, <laughs> and through my performing as a comedy writer or a, an actress in LA, it just gives me life. I just am able to breathe through this life in a very palatable way. It makes me feel so alive. And when I feel like I'm not given an opportunity to create in that way, I know that I'm going to have to break down the barriers in my mind or break down the barriers that are in front of me to be able to create that art and make it happen for me every time because I just have to be able to do it. And so, bless his heart, my lovely husband drove three days across the plains of the Midwest from South Dakota to Los Angeles so that I could experience living in Los Angeles and really pursuing my, my, my career as an actor. <coughs> and from that point on, I know that I can never go back. I have to keep moving forward and constantly be creating to really be happy. And I'm just hoping that whatever I create is something that can enlighten and be shared with others. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh. She's, she's, <laughs> she said it all. I mean, the way Kay just dis talked about the word art, I'm sure all of you go, yeah, that's, that's what it is. That's what I do. Yeah. 
I mean, it, it's a very liberating feeling to just be able to express, to create, to break some rules, you know, to innovate, to have motivation, to be so positive, to be able to, I mean, that's the whole ball of wax. I mean, it's, the role is really, I mean, you're, you're, you're born that way. I mean, there's always a struggle for the work. I mean, you always struggle through the work. I mean, some people will say, what do you want to be an artist for? I mean, you got to find a job and you got to pay the bills, right? You know, you got to find something that has more structure. Well, since we've been married, I mean, she's always, you know, said, I mean, good luck, find a job, good luck, but, you know, I'm, you know, we have to take care of the bills. Good luck. But when you have a job and you're not happy, you know, you're just struggling, why are you, why are you doing that work? I mean, you don't have the, that passion. If that's, I mean, I could do the artwork. I know I could do that. You could, and she'll say, yeah, do your thing. And I'm saying, but what about the pay? She's always been there saying, well, we'll figure it out. You know, so she is truly, truly my better half. She's been there all the way, all the time. And it's 100%. And as an, the artwork, you know, it's gonna work out. I know it will. You know, we, we connect with a lot of people. She's like she said, we've got emails from, from all over about our work and, and, and our vision and our, our passion and so, so many things it has been so amazing and it's you know it's just so much i you know it's just it's our nature it's natural i so yes it there is a responsibility and my role is to educate children you know i i love children and i want to see the kids out there i want to see them searching for opportunities so that's where my place is here, to show through our work, through our humor, through our life, that we're great, we're doing fine, life is good, I'm being creative. Let children see that. And as they grow, they'll, they'll learn more. I mean, it's, I never had that type of exposure before. You know, I had always learned that you're, you find a job, that's how you take care of yourself. You, you, buy things, you have insurance, I mean, you do things. But now it's more of a go with the flow. So I think my role is to maintain my inner artist and to just keep things going, you know, and really keep it going and, you know, not get uh, distracted. You know, we'll have a plan B, we'll have an emergency backup plan, but it's not something that I want to focus on. I want to focus on what we're doing now and Things will work out, you know? It's like that saying about the, um, you know, if you build it, people will come. You know, same idea. You know, we do the artwork and we show it, you share your ideas, people will come. And it, it works out. So, that's where we're at. Thank you. Well, I certainly echo, um, Matt and Kay's sentiment that art is life. Um, for me, I'm also a writer, so that's a, a type of creative expression that I focused on for a long time and sort of left drawing behind for a while. And now I'm realizing that there was a reason that I stopped drawing for so long. And that was because it can be easy for the hardships of life to sometimes put a block up to your creativity. And it's a good idea to try and figure out what that is and what happened. Um, when I went to art school, I went to art school in a very dangerous city and I lived in a very bad neighborhood and there was a lot of crime. Um, and I think it really frightened me, um, kind of away from art for a while because I started to associate it with 
some of that trauma from that time, but I didn't make that connection for about 10 years. And it was through writing another creative process, writing about art and remembering that time in my life that I discovered that I was actually very upset about some things that had happened during that time. And once I began to really feel that, uh, the block went away, and it was really a powerful thing. So I also was kind of told in academia that art didn't really have a place in what I was doing anymore. And if I wanted to do um, a project that incorporated art and history, I wouldn't be able to do that because this is academia and we don't do art in academia. Well, that's, that's not accurate because you cannot separate art from, from anything. Art is everywhere. Art is in every little thing. Somebody designed this building and they made the chairs we're sitting on and the computers and just and when you look around, you know, life is art, design and beauty. And it, it infiltrates every aspect of study and every area of study. So one way that I began to incorporate the two worlds of academia and art is um, to draw theory. And I started to draw theoretical infographics for my critical disability studies class. And it really resonated with people and I wasn't sure if anyone was going to like it or understand it. But theory is to me very visual and um, my areas of thought and study um, in academia, when I think about the work I'm doing, the thoughts come to me in pictures. So why not try to represent that in some way? And I'm starting to reconcile those two areas of my life and bring the art back into academia because just like you cannot segregate disabled people or pretend that disabled people do not exist in your world, you cannot pretend that art does not play a role in just about every area. And it's important to recognize that because there are a lot of people like Matt and Kay and myself and everyone here at this table, and probably a lot of you here in this room, that really love art. Art is a huge part of our life. It is who we are. And you cannot separate that. And if it's who we are, people with disabilities or deaf people, then you cannot separate the art from that, and you cannot separate the disability from it, and you can't take it out of anything, because that's, um, that's what it's all about. It's a lot of layers of complexity. Um, I wouldn't say that I became an artist until probably around last year, and I'm gonna tell you why. So. I started dancing since I was in fourth grade. I did all types of dance. I started writing, I would say efficient, like seriously, probably um, my junior year in high school. I didn't start doing poetry until my freshman year in college. But even while I was doing those things and people understood it to be art and said, oh, this is really great. I like these pieces. I love that dance. I'm gonna, I wanna learn from you and this and that. I didn't really, I didn't consider it real. Um, uh, so I don't think I became an artist until last year because last year is when I, I would say I actually officially stopped asking for permission with what the work I was doing. Um, I was, I, I would start taking risks. And so I would expand what art meant to me, um, what it meant, you know, beyond dance, beyond writing poetry. How can I elevate it? And so with dance, I would, do very theatrical pieces. It was very dramatic. I would have props now. I would really incorporate different people. I would, um, I would just really expand that frame of the place that I was in to make it more than just a dance. It was more of an experience. When it came down to poetry, I changed that because I didn't want to just write about my feelings. I wanted my feelings to mean something to someone else um, in relation to. So um, my poetry started um, talking more about social justice and the things that I was going through, like the real stuff, not just, oh, I got my heart broken. Well, what does it mean to get my heart broken in the community that I live in where no one really cares that I got my heart broken? You know, what does it mean when I'm on stage and I'm writing about how um, 
you know, let's say I experienced this really traumatic event and people clap and they snap and say, oh, that was a really good metaphor, that was a really good line. And then I get off stage and no one comforts me. I just go and take a seat. You know, I expanded that to, to, for my poetry to mean something and for others to enc encompany, like in that space and um, join me. So I started doing more um, collabor like, um, collabor collaborative pieces where it wasn't just me on stage, but it was me um, getting in touch with other people that I knew were slam poets and helping me really pull that out of me. And so I didn't see art as this, um, just a singular thing for what it meant to me, but what it meant for someone else um, in relation with me. And so I always wanted my art pieces to be very collaborative, to be, um, to mean more than just surface level. And so um, then I started, you know, with writing, I think I didn't start for it to mean something to me personally until this children's book, until it had a broader meaning, until it was off paper. And I was really saying, okay, here, I had this is what I wrote, and I'm proud of what I wrote, and I'm sharing it. Um, and then now I started doing documentaries. And so I'm almost finished my first documentary. And I know it's going to be controversial. I know it's, it's going to be a difficult, com difficult conversation to have, but that's what art is. And that's what I want my art to mean. I want it to, I want it to always be a conversation piece. I don't want it to just live in a room or live on my walls or live on my Facebook page, but to really expand and to be a lot deeper and to really be a community effort. Um, and so being an artist, it's more than feelings. It's, it's conversation, it's dialogue, it's, it's action, it's all of those wrapped in one, but making sure that you involve different mediums and different modes so that other people can um, be a part of that. And so that's what art means to me, that's what being an artist means to me. Um, it takes time for you to say that out loud, but once you do, it's so liberating. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's awesome. Wow, what everybody has said here has just been amazing for me. A lot of what Matt said is things that I want to say, and I want to thank you for expressing that. But I mean, art just means so many things to so many people. It's a diverse topic. But one of the things that we're talking about is a mode of expression. And in that way, it's the same for all of us. As an artist growing up, when I went to college, I wanted to be a government major. And then I decided to drop my art for a while and just focus on that. And I realized when art wasn't in my life that it wasn't right. Something was seriously missing. Who I am, I was holding it back. I was suppressing it. I wasn't letting it be a part of who I am. And I admit, I tend to be a people pleaser. That's part of, that's an aspect of my personality. And so I thought I'd major in government and get a good job and fulfill my familial expectations. And I'm a transgender um, individual, a pansexual person, but I also suppressed that because I didn't think that that was something that would please society very much at all. So I was suppressing all of these important aspects of myself and I had anxiety and depression in college for obvious reasons. So. After college, um, just like you were talking about, I need to get a good job, I need to have insurance, I need to be responsible, I need to be, um, you know, I'm gonna be the only deaf person in a hearing community and show the world how uh, capable I am. And, and I had an iPad and I was doing some drawing on that and some graphic design and it was not real art. I mean, it was just like a very deadened type of creativity. And I did all this and I'm so, you know, I, when people share their art and it comes out, it's wonderful to see and it's very moving, but what I was doing was not fulfilling. So that's what I was doing for a while. And I began to realize that something was really missing. You know, art is a rich and complex modality. And just like everybody has said, art is in everything. It's here in front of us. Someone designed the chair, someone designed the building. So when I realized that, I said, this is about who I am. 
And in the summer of 2013, I was accepted into a um, deaf education master's degree program. And I thought, okay, I'll become a teacher for deaf children. Yes, it's a passion. I love children. I would love to be an educator. That would be a stable job, it would be a responsible thing to do. But then I saw some comics and my love came back and I went to the bathroom and I just had a breakdown because I knew that that's what I really wanted. It was something that was a necessity for me. I was an artist and that was who I was. So I told my parents I want to do comics and they said, fine, wonderful. I think they knew that I wasn't happy. They could see that I loved comics and art. And at the same time, I was also transgender, so there were all these things going on in me, and I realized I have to live for myself. Being my true self will actually contribute to the world in more significant ways than if I tried to be somebody I'm not. Being your true self is the way to give to the world. I mean, you can put on a happy face and do something that's not you, but it's not going to impact the world in the same way. If you follow your passions, you change the world. So I'm an artist. That's what I do. It's beautiful. It's enriching. I have a wonderful job, and it's very fulfilling. Um, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify real quick that um, you were using the word transgendered. Um, yeah. So just clarifying, um, using the word transgendered is a bit uh, outdated. It'd almost be like I'm whited. I've always been white, right? So um, using transgendered would come a, kind of note, connote that that's not just something that is consistent, right? Of course, transitioning is a process. That's I'm sorry, what's not consistent? I, I don't understand. Oh, hold on. Oh. To use the verb transition, it's an active verb, not transgendered. But it, it, it's fine. It's just wanted to <laughs> clarify real quick. The ed at the end is not used because it's not, <laughs> it's it's an old-fashioned term. You just say transgender without the ed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I didn't want to throw shade. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, so okay. Oh yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about um, is by my experience being an illustrator here at Syracuse. Um, I went through four years of being an illustration major here at Syracuse and having an LGBT studies minor. Um, at a certain point, my minor turned into my major, and I really got more into it, support and advocacy for the LGBT community, which turned into general students, which turned into intersectional students and er everybody in the club. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I think is interesting is that I st I'm an artist, right? So I went through four years, and I realized like I was in class, I was doing six hours of drawing every day, and I loved it. Um, but at the beginning of class, I would have a professor say, okay, so today we're drawing a cowboy. There's gonna be people in the profession of illustration who are gonna ask you to draw cowboys, and ladybugs, and can you please draw their daughter, or can you please draw this uh, storybook about a puppy? Um, so while you may have elements of yourself in these drawings, when we're talking about specifically the profession of illustration, um, when it comes to profitability and being, having a livable wage, you're going to be drawing other people's thoughts and feelings with the touches of yourself, right? Um, and I think if you can find that sweet spot where you're drawing about what you know and it is you, what a magic moment. But that's not what I was taught in my academia. Um, I was taught about traditional art, the ideal body, which is problematic in and of itself, and all of those concepts. Um, and then at the end of four years, I was like, I just want to do art for me. Is that okay? So I didn't want to have that as something that was my full-time job. Um, I want something that was different because art was so personal for me. Um, so while, like, so the way I, I have two modes of art that I do, um, the most of the art I've been doing here today has been my self-personal language and my self-care art, if that makes sense. Um, so that's very like doodly, so I have like hundreds of doodles, if that's how I kind of communicate with myself. I think all of us have our own modes of self-language, and I think for me, doodling has always been that. So I think when people saw me in you know, elementary school, middle school, college, 
doodling, being like, oh, you should be an illustrator. And I was like, let me make it a draw about my feelings. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so that's kind of how that played out. And then I have um, the art that you see when I'm doing the Axis Avengers, which is like I do hundreds and hundreds of layers of different digital painting, um, which has an underlying of you know hours and hours of drawing specific line work through a graphite pencil. Um, and that's the art that um, I do that talks about my depression, my anxiety, my queerness, my erotic, like my eroticism. So when I think about the art that I do in my personal practice, of course, the Access Avengers is in, in tandem with the um, office, uh, the Disability Cultural Center. Um, but when I talk about my personal art practice, it's something that talks about my anxiety and my sexuality. Um, if any of you are familiar with the artist the to uh, Tom of Finland, um, he's a very Can you spell that? yeah, uh, Tom of Finland. Uh, so see like Tom and Jerry, and then Finland like the country. Um, he's a very erotic artist. Uh, who was very predominant in the late 70s uh, with the gay male population. And it was like big muscular dudes and pardon my French, like big huge dicks and like in police officer costumes and like waddling around being all macho. Um, and I love that art because I think it talks about what we want in idealized bodies. And I'm so fascinated by that. So being able to kind of, you know, look at my own practice and being like subverse that, but also kind of magnify these weird items about sexuality that I think are permeated in queer culture. Um, and then also when it comes to my anxiety, a narrative that I have is that when I was a kid, I would get panic attacks every night because I was afraid there was going to be a skeleton in my window. Um, I think it's funny now, but definitely a panic attack is never fun. So one day I sat to myself and I was like, you know what, if I'm so scared of skeletons, I'm going to really sit down and just draw skeletons forever. Um, so every time moving forward from that, I've really what I've done is if something I'm scared of or something that I'm nervous about, I flip a switch in my head and I make it something that I'm super interested in. Um, so one example is nausea, so like drawing really realistic, hyper-realistic vomit or like people who feel sick and like, you know, blood and guts and I don't know. That's, that's really what I, I do and explore when it comes to my personal art practice that is outside my self-language. Um, and I think one thing, as I've transitioned from being a, you know, an illustrator to a higher admi education administrator, it, the thing is I also work at art colleges, so I have the privilege of being a change agent and a mentor to art students um, and also artists, right? So having experiences where I'm working with our burlesque club um, and having a story with um, one of our students who is buying nipple tassels for the burlesque club and hearing about how they're reclaiming their sexuality after and working with PTSD after a sexual assault, being able to talk with that student, be an active listener, and also help support them getting access to resources, which helps validate their movement, you know, within their disability, is something that I get to do with every student that walks in my office, or a student who has chronic pain, who's like, I don't think my professor understands that carrying a 40-foot painting is going to be painful going across the street, and being like, well, your professor shouldn't be having you do that. Have you gone to the Learning Resource Center? Have you made accommodations and making a phone call so they don't have to do that, right? So being that liaison and being that person who gives that student the megaphone that they need to be able to triage for equity. Thank you. So what I'd like to do now is ask someone to have a mic roam around the room. I'm hoping we can have a mic roamer. Do we have someone who wants to do mic roaming? I thought we had a mic roamer in the room, but if we don't, I'll do it myself, and that's perfectly fine. Anyone? Thank you, Aaron. This is our uh, ADA 503-504 coordinator, Aaron Hedukovic, <coughs> who's a friend of mine. Thank you for being our roam. Roam where you want to. Roam around the world. That's what the B-52s say. So. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions, and then I'm going to make some closing comments, uh, mostly spontaneously, and then we'll pause and have some film time. But I really want to make space for people to reflect on all these incredible things we've just been experiencing with this beautiful panel. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share or ask? Yes, we have a question over here, two questions. Are we setting up mics? Is that what's happening? Okay, we're, we're out of mics. Do you need my mic? Questions? My name is Elsa Pella, and I was with like uh, at the house cabins one time. I don't know if anybody knows where that is. South side, almost close to Auburn, or Albany, New York. 
someplace out there. Well, my question was, speak about bear with me with the death. I had, we went through house caverns. I had with Jim Johnston with us, and we had a crew. We're going into the cave. And I had Teddy Holmes, and I had other deaf people, and especially with the ones it cannot go under the cave. We had some racial mark on the side where we're underneath that. Anyway, I told them they said they were making fun of us because we were holding our hands. We were like, you know, connecting because the fact that if we're going into some cave, you have to be careful with, with deaf people. So anyway, someone said something out of the way or out of line, and I told them, you ought to be thankful. You're not deaf or blind, because it can happen to you at any time, any place someday. So anyway, we went to the cabin. I had right straight through it. Every one of them, and all of them, the deaf people, they appreciated me going into that cave and coming out of that cave without getting hurt. I think Jim Johnston really appreciated that. I hope that a lot of people will turn around and change from a negative attitude to a plus attitude, plus 110%. And we had another blind person too. At Teddy Holmes, this dude can play a piano, he can play most anything, and he can play organ. Don't let people fool you, because both his ears, on both sides, he was deaf, and he was blind. Guess who came by when someone had to use the bathroom? No one would help out Teddy. <coughs> Guess who come up and let him to help him go to the bathroom? Mr. Big Al, because I care so much. And to this day, I will never forget that. Then we had one more blind person when I was on East Genesee, right? He fell on the sidewalk. I come running like a form like an archangel and help that man up. Of course. I told him who I was because he's not very far from the building. I can't remember his name up to this day. When I helped him up, someone is going to look out for you someday. But Thank you. Do you have any other questions for the panelists? Well, first of all, I guess I want to just say thank you to the panelists, the interpreters, and everyone else who made this conference possible, and as awesome as it has been. Um, so this was my first Cripping the Con, and I think I'm kind of hooked and I am coming back. But anyway, um, <laughs> today, I guess for me, kind of, it was like I've seen little reflections of the past 23 years of life, because um, I also use art, and I'm disabled both visually and physically um, and I think today was a really cool reminder um, of the power that art has both in the disability community and as a statement maker and a whole bunch of other ways and also humor in general I mean how I first started explaining my disability to the able-bodied community because as a girl that went to all mainstream schools so I was one of very few students with disabilities um, to try to explain to someone that your eyes move back and forth and it's really not funny when you throw a volleyball in my face and then laugh at the point where I can't catch it. Um, I had to think of something easy that they were, how they were going to understand it, so I started going with humor. So the new thing became not that my eyes move back and forth, but that I see three of balls coming at me and I really don't know which one to hit. So if I threw three volleyballs at you, would you know? And of course they were like, well, no, because there's three of them, and how do you expect us to see three? I said, exactly. Think of that the next time you throw one at my face. But anyway, so I guess my question for the panelist is, as fellow artists yourself, what would be, I guess, a piece of advice that you would give to students and, I guess, other people who maybe have a passion, for a lack of a better word, for art, 
Um, but also everyday life kind of gets in the way and that artist kind of sometimes gets suppressed. I'm happy to respond to that. Um, if I were one of my faculty members, I would say practice, practice, practice. But I'm not one of my faculty members and I have a totally different philosophy about art. Um, I think what's so important is that your art's unique to you, right? I think the moment you reflect other folks' expectations on what your art is, I think the moment it becomes ingenuine, inauthentic, and just not cool. I don't know. Um, I think I know one thing that I think Pablo Picasso is kind of a basic sniff artist, right? But one thing that I think he really was positive about, he's like, I love the, the drawings and the art of kids because it's like, no one's like, Timmy, that looks like crap, right? <laughs> it's like, it's pure, raw expression. So one thing I would encourage for anyone who's doing art is find that pure, raw expression for yourself. <coughs> Put it through a siphon. I think the siphon, whether it, that's practice, whether that's your intent of the art, right? And look through that siphon, which is like, I would say that's the siphon of reflecting on others and what's best practices. And then go back to that vivacious energy of what you started with and marry the two. So I think that's my recommendation. But I think start with not having expectations that are built around others. I think you'll see a lot of illustrators who start being like, I like anime, so I'm going to draw anime. I'm like, nah, I, maybe not. Because that's an expectation that's not yours, right? So I think that's a really great start to being, a, being an artist. Cool. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, I'll get to see you. And you can That's a good question. When I work with students and I show them my artwork, they ask me questions about it. I'm happy to answer those questions, but repeatedly, what I hear is, how, how do you do it? How can you create this? And I, I do say practice, <laughs> but that doesn't, it's not a very satisfactory answer. It's very hard to convey the key to unlocking your secret creativity and talent. But one of the things I do is I share my art, the Pokemon work that I do, because it matches the children's ages that I'm working with, you know, the nine-year-old, nine 10-year-old, and they like that. It's like the popular, you know, Pokemon is a popular character for the kids, and it's exciting for them to see that. So that intrigues them and gets their interest. So one thing that I have to really start, you know, you have to start somewhere. And that's one of the things that I say is start the process, show them how to practice, show them how to start developing their skill, and then you go on from there and go for it and never stop. Just follow your passion. You no, know, I, I think you've said it. Okay, would you like? Just a couple of uh, pieces of advice that were given to me as uh, an actor and as a writer for a comic strip, uh, Matt and I were at a cartoon convention in Las Vegas, and I talked to a cartoonist who just, it seems like he just hits it home every single time he writes a cartoon. And in my opinion, I just felt like it was just out of the ballpark every single time. So funny, uh, just always made me laugh. And I said, um, can you give me some advice as a comedy writer? I'm kind of, this was at that time we were just starting that deaf guy and I said, can you give me any advice? And he goes, you know what? It's okay to suck in the beginning. <laughs> it's okay. Just know that you're going to get better and give yourself permission to bomb <coughs> and you know, hashtag fail or whatever. Um, I don't think we were hashtagging back then. I don't remember, but anyway, that really opened me up to opened us up to sometimes we're going to knock it out of the park. Sometimes it just really feels good. It just kind of vibrates in us. And we go, this is really funny. This is really great. And then sometimes we're really struggling. We, <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. It's like... <laughs> sometimes we're really struggling. And so there's a perception that art is easy because we're doing it. Not necessarily. Some days it's just effortless and it just seems to flow. And then some days it is a real, real struggle and we question it. <laughs> and then as an actor as well, um, in Los Angeles, it's so competitive. And I have to just say that I have committed to art for life. I'm a lifer. I'll never give up. <laughs> and that's, you know, whether I really become successful or we can be 
become full-time cartoonists. It doesn't matter. We're lifers. That's it. Hashtag art lifer. <laughs> Anyone else have any responses to the question? <laughs> any other questions? Yes, so this is our last question. It's okay, it's important, and it's you. Enjoy it, and thank you. Um, I'm just so completely blown away by all the stories that you all shared, and it was such an absolute treat to hear you all talk about your art and your life experiences, and really very honored to hear all that. Um, I'm not a visual artist at all, that's not where my skills lie, I would say, but I write, and poetry has been a big part of my life for a long time, um, and something that I grapple with in my writing, um, in my personal life, and academically, is this question of um, being construed or, or times in which your writing is taken and kind of co-opted and um, like the problematics of being conceived of as like a like a native informant to what you speak, especially when what you write about or draw about or when your art maybe speaks to um, the more complex and painful or difficult like lived realities that are heterogeneous and that can't, so I don't know if I'm making sense, but when you're read as being like the, the bearer of knowledge for um, a group, like a heterogeneous like collective, or so how to, how to navigate like putting your stories out there and not um, with the risk of being taken as like the sort of, um, or the risk of what you're saying being co-opted or taken as more than just an, an individual's experiences, or rather as like, um, the marker of authenticity, so to speak, which really I feel like is, well, there's so much to be said about that, but I'm just, that's something I grapple with a lot, so I'm curious how other folks who um, write or do other forms of art think about that in their work, if at all. Um, I would say I never... A little, little closer. Sorry. Little closer. That's okay. Thank you. Better. Yes, better. Um, I wouldn't say I necessarily had that problem before, but that is a question that I always ask myself every time I do write something. Um, on one hand, my answer to that is people are going to say that anyway. People are going to automatically put that on you when you're going so far off the end or if you're say if you're having a if you're if in your writing you have a topic that it's so heavy people would automatically because they don't want to have the discussion they will automatically put the blame on you and say you're trying to have this conversation for everyone else um, or you're you know you're misusing your your power basically so on one hand you just gotta ignore people who do that because you know why you why you wrote this um, that was your piece, and that is your original piece, and therefore you have to continue, and you have to own that. Uh, but on the second hand, um, the you do have to be mindful, um, and I, I do try my best to be very mindful when I'm writing something. And to be mindful, it take I, I would say I'll break it down in two steps. So one would be, while you're writing it, think of if you personally have a connection to that piece that you're writing. Really think back, think really hard, okay, what is my experience? Why am I writing about that? And if you can really um, take a step back and basically place a marker why this conversation or why this piece is important to you, you're on the right track. And then the second part is to, um, if you don't necessarily have a connection but you do have an interest in it and you still wanna write about it, make sure that you reach out to the community that you feel that that piece is about because it is very easy to have assumptions um, from where you're standing because you're not within that community. So make sure that you at least step out of that, step out of that circle, step out of your social stance to, um, to really just present the idea, hear that feedback, that feedback, feedback part is an extremely important part in writing. Yeah, that's a great question. When I'm doing um, comics or any art, it's a story. And I guess, you know, there's always um, the potential for being misconstrued. There's always going to be misunderstandings. There's always going to be somebody out there who takes it wrong or does, takes, you know, has just like a Facebook comment. 
somebody will make a post and then you see all of this drama around it and misconstruing of what was said or what's represented. And it's really exactly what I wanted to say too, that writing or art or whatever expression it is, if you are writing about a community of which you're not a member, it's very important to get feedback from them. It's sort of a sad thing though, sometimes when you see art that is just beautiful or comics or web, web comics, whatever you see, it's wonderful, like transgender characters in a story. It's great to see that representation, but then you see some errors. Yeah, there's just misinformation, different things that happen. Um, the internet <laughs> can be very abusive, so sometimes if there's a misconstruction or something goes wrong, there's drama, there's a lot of um, negativity that is generated from that. I mean, a lot of times an artist, if they make a mistake in representing a community of which they're not a part, they'll say, I'm sorry, I, it's a learning process for me and I appreciate the feedback. But I think it's very, very important that um, if you are representing a minority community, that more minority people should be representing themselves. And that's, that's true for deaf culture as well. He was like, you're talking about my culture, my community, I'm right here, I can do that better than anyone. And I think it's vital to connect with the community and make sure that you're accurately representing them. If a hearing person wanted to do um, some kind of art related to the deaf culture, deaf community, get in touch with me, check in with me, make sure it's an accurate representation of my lived experience. And if other people on the internet say that's not right, you didn't do that right, you can say, I spoke with Carlisle, why don't you get in touch with Carlisle? And so I, I'm not saying that I know everything about the deaf community. I, I am not the end all or be all when it comes to that but I'm a safe place for people to come and get feedback on what, what, what it means to represent a deaf lived experience. So I'm not the only one, I'm not the spokesperson for every deaf person in the world, but I can be an advocate and I can support your work. So that's basically, you know, research. Contacting the community, checking in with them. And I mean, perhaps you want to do a quid pro quo where you give something to that person because they gave something to you. But don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone and ask people that you're not familiar with about what your art is representing for that community. I, did that answer your question? I'd love to add. Um, I think there, there's been two elements that I think people are talking about, your, like representing yourself and representing others. I think one thing that folks have said, be like, oh my God, come to me, I can hook you up with all the information. I think one thing that when we're talking about smaller communities, and although Syracuse University is a big campus, it is a, still a small community. Um, I currently work at a college of about 2,000 students. And I think there tends to be, I think the word tokenizing, I think tends to be a concern a lot of the times, and I think especially at institutions of education, and it's almost forgiven at a college. Like let's say you have a faculty, like for example, Shadra Strickland is a, an alumni of, um, this in, of Syracuse from the illustration program. She's also an illustration faculty member at MICA. And if someone's like, I wanna talk to a faculty member about the black illustration experience, they're gonna go to Shadra, right? So we have 50 students who have this assignment in their critical writing class going to Shadra for that question. Shadra, thinking internally, and I can't speak for Shadra, but I can speak for myself as someone who's like, oh, the one trans staff on campus is Jill, go talk to them about the trans experience. Am I gonna turn that student away? No, because it's an educational institution, and I understand that I've, I've accepted for myself that that's something that I'm willing to do, but not everyone's willing to do that, and just kind of go in being like, someone might say no, right? Or maybe not just depend on one person. I think that even comes with letters of recommendation. You like email a faculty at 10 o'clock at night being like, I need this letter of recommendation for an internship, oh my God, please can you write it, right? You don't wanna do that with identity, identity representation either. So really be mindful of that and take your time, call and email a couple people and then kind of see from there. I think it's important to give people that element of self-care and knowing that, especially at Syracuse or at any kind of small community, there may be one person who has that identity or maybe like five and they like email each other being like, I got that email again from a student about that writing project that happens every September, right? So just knowing that that's a thing that happens. Um, and I think that it's for self. Um, I think it's important to understand that like knowing your line in the sand, 
right? Knowing that, like, what am I willing to share with myself? And I think sometimes when you're, I know when I was in college, I was an oversharer. So I was like, oh, here's all of my experiences. And then I go into my professional practice being like, I don't think I'm going to share that again. I don't know what that they gave me some health, healthy dynamics with my narrative that I wanted, right? So don't share that in the public. And I think it takes critical thought, like reading a piece over to yourself to be like, is this something I want to share, right? So I think that's about sharing for yourself because my anxiety tells me, but it's also a healthy assumption that if something goes public, there's going to be someone who's going to throw some serious shade on it and the worst thing's going to happen, especially if it's on the internet, like you said. Troll culture there is particularly, um, I have a partner who lives in Berlin and he did an illustrated piece about like a trans translator about what you know cisgender folks say and then what trans folks hear. Um, and he got so, like, his illustrations were great. He didn't write it, almost like the comic, uh, that deaf guy. He did the illustrations, but he didn't write it. But he got so much shame, being like, oh my god, this was, you know, trans misogynistic, the way you talked about this. This is, you know, uh, cis-normative, where you're talking about, you know, trans folks needing to uh, accommodate for, like, you know, gender expression norms. And, like, Rory was like, oh, I don't believe in any of, he's British, and I don't want to do a British accent, but he's like, I don't, I'm not any of those things. I'm like, god, that's terrible. So it's like kind of sitting down and like, you're, you're going to see other folks go through it, and you're going to see yourself go through it, and just take a breath, expect it to be happening. I like to take a breath. I think we should pause with that. And I want to give a warm round of applause and however you want to express applause to this incredible panel of artists. And so what I want to do now is uh, the panelists are welcome to sit with me here or to join the crowd in whatever way you want to do that. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes uh, asking everybody to think reflectively about this Comic-Con, which was very different in its structure and ideas and design than others, but in some ways echoes ones we've done in the past. And I do have some ideas I've already shared with you publicly about an international summit between this United Kingdom-based group called the Department of Ability, uh, joining us here in the Axis Avengers and having a conversation in 2017 where we're talking about superheroes with disabilities, talking together, and I think of these characters as alive uh, and not as only imaginary. So I, the only few comments I wanted to make in closing, and then I think we should go buy some merch because there's so much great stuff outside and get some more autog autographs. My Brooklyn accent almost came out there. Some more autographs. So we can go back outside and um, do that in just a moment. But I just had some things I wanted to reflect on with you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank really deeply all of the people who are here on this panel and also Cece Bell uh, and everyone who joined us today in these conversations. I think about 175 people were here, and that's an incredible thing. I thought we were maybe going to break 80, and then people kept registering and registering. People came from Toronto and Rochester and Schenectady and Manhattan and Yonkers and all over the place. Massachusetts, someone came in from Fresno. Uh, it was obviously, uh, uh, yes, of course, I, yes, I, like, a student came from Ohio on their way to a visit at a local university and came over because they heard that these folks were coming and they wanted to meet them and they're, they're deaf and their dad is hearing and it was a great, uh, wonderful conversation to watch unfold. Um, so I, I just really appreciate the gravity of people's um, coming out, so to speak, in this conversation. So I think that some of the things I wanted to highlight was you know, the anti-ableist incentive behind the Comic-Con and the ways that people don't just get to say they're allies uh, and the idea that ally is a verb, not a noun. Um, and I think one of the things that was uh, repeatedly commented upon, commented upon this evening was the ways that uh, we are illustrating inclusion. And I'm saying that pun since it is April Fool's Day and you know the theme um, in a very purposeful way. So uh, if anyone has any comments or suggestions or critical feedback, you can put it on the evaluations, but you can also share it right now. And I want to give people just a few minutes to have the floor and comment on the entire Comic-Con, just for a few minutes, and then we'll pause. Uh, you can get some merch and get some autographs and take a breath. And then what we're going to do is, well, at least I am, maybe some people will come, I hope so. We're going to show the, um, Oscar-winning animated film, Inside Out, which I think of as a disability narrative because of how it negotiates emotional wellness and what some people call madness in the life of a child. 
And that will be screened in the Huntington Beard Krauss Auditorium known as Gifford. And we will have inclusive snacks at 915, including ice cream and popcorn, all of which will be available to you for free. And then the movie will start at 10 o'clock and will be about an hour and 42 minutes, I think. And we'll pause and have some conversation. Of course, the film will be shown with captions and audio description, and there will be American Sign Language interpreters with us the entire time. So does anyone have any comments or thoughts or final points they'd like to share? You can also just chill and go buy some merch and just have some tea. That's what you'd rather do. It's fine with me. Anybody have anything they'd like to say? Aaron is still wi willing with the mic there. I see him there. Thank you, Aaron. Yes. Okay, who, someone over here, Al. I appreciate it. One second, one second. We're bringing you a mic so that our live transcriber can ga gather what we're saying. I appreciate this show tonight. I appreciate everything that's been said. Thank you, Al. Al, you're welcome. Other comments? Okay. Um, I mean, as I said before, I thought this was amazing, especially because it's my first time. Um, the only thing I would have liked, I know a couple, well, one of my friends who's been here in previous years has mentioned that it's been divided over the course of two days instead of one. Um, for someone like me, where it's visi visually, I can't speak towards the end of the night, um, and physically taxing, I think it would be better to have it over a longer period of time because I just feel like we were trying to get so much in, which is great because I loved going to everyone's presentations and walking around to all the different booths and talking to a bunch of different people. That was wonderful, but I just think it would have been better spread out a little more. Thank you. <laughs> we had it two days last year and two days yeah, the year before. I'm for two days. <laughs> yeah. We had it for two days last year and two, years, two days the year before. And um, you know, I guess we'll have to return to that model. So I appreciate the feedback. Hi, I just want to thank you again for organizing this symposium. I was on the end of organizing a conference for the first time a couple months ago, so I know how much work goes into that. So thank uh, everyone. Um, I would just like to follow up on the previous comment. Um, I think one thing with the format that would have helped or I would have liked to have seen is um, not doing concurrent sessions. Um, not just because I, I wanted to see everyone's talk, but I think it also took away from some of the conversation that could have happened, um, because in the panels that I presented at and that I was also in attending, or that I attended, um, there were not very many questions or no questions at all. And um, as someone who comes to conferences to present work, one of the things I value is getting feedback on my own work. So I think um, not holding concurrent sessions would help, you know, uh, bring more people into the room um, to listen to the talks and maybe facilitate more questions. And also just having um, the format be instead of questions after each individual talk, perhaps it would be after everyone on the panel gets mm -hmm. to speak so that people have time to process and also make connections between um, all the other speakers on the panel as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. I appreciate it. When people moderate, I think it's up to them. And I think what I can do in the future is I can tell moderators and timekeepers, this is the format we prefer based on the inclusion we're trying to create. And so rather than having discussion with one person, then another, then another, having it be more organic and shared topically, and afterwards everyone gets to share, but not have as many things going on at one time, uh, and then there's more time for everyone to speak and collaborate with each other. Does that paraphrase what you're getting at? Okay, thanks very much. Take a couple of more comments and questions. Anybody? It could be about anything. Oh, Rachel has a question, Aaron. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I think I'm having a little anxiety because I'm very shy. And sometimes when I'm a little um, not sure what I want to say, I get very anxious. And I had all these questions I was going to ask, and now I'm like very terrified. Um, so I might take me some time to get back to you. I have a lot of, 
it's, I'm just I'm just full of joy what you've talked mm. about uh, the people who are here um, so I just want to express that and I might have some I might have some things to say later uh, maybe I'll email them to people I, I feel embarrassed that I'm shy like I don't want to come and talk to Carla I'm like or Matt and Kate, I think they're rock stars. So it's kind of like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm so excited. Um, so I had to say that. So I'm, I'm not avoiding you, I'm just, I'm just kind of scared. So um, and this, working with Diane in this event has always been a labor of love and we just, wow. That's all I can say, wow. I'm going to say that we should stop there. Yeah. We have time for one more. We've got somebody with their hand. Oh, we have a question, and we're not stopping there. We're going to. Hi, Jason. It's all you. It's all you. It's not really a question, but um, Thanks, Jason. I spend um, pretty much most of the year covering all the Comic Cons in upstate New York and the Northeast side. And um, every time I go to a Comic Con, there's always somebody with special needs or disabilities there. But there are no. This is the only con that I know of in upstate New York, or really possibly New York State together, that, that is, is what you guys are. That is a 100% pro, uh, you know, uh, special needs con. You know what I mean? An empowering con. And I don't know any other con like that. And my only suggestion is, which I, I think you guys I mean, you had just answered, but it's very hard for people to do stuff during the weekend. Friday, I know, is the weekend. But it's very hard to, you know, for a lot of people to travel and stuff. So if it is on Saturday, even if you want to change the one day to Saturday, you know what I mean? That would make a world of difference as far as attendance goes and everything else. But I would just say keep doing what you're doing because there's no, there's no other con in the state like it from what I've seen in the last couple of years of covering cons. So thank you for having me, too. Thanks very much. Hey. All right. So let's have a nice evening, and there might be some snackage left. I don't know. I just work here. I don't know about everything. But uh, please uh, enjoy each other's company. And